Now we go on to Mantu test. Now this was another era. Mantu is a very grey area, very very grey area. I mean, we've had abdominal TB being uh, presented, and we we said Mantu positive, abdominal lymph nodes there. A lot of pediatricians would start AKT in these patients, or you would have patients where they've had fever cough for seven days. Somebody did a Mantu in them. Mantu came positive. Now what to do? Fever cough has disappeared. X-ray is normal, but Mantu is positive. Now what to do? So we ourselves put ourselves in soup. You know, we like to hit ourselves only. Abdominal pain, before doing a urine and stool, we do an ultrasound. Every ultrasound is obviously going to pick up lymph nodes. And then we don't know what to do. And then we do a Mantu because there were lymph nodes. And we get a Mantu positive. And then at, after that, we are still more confused what to do. And then, then you have these Mantus which are of different strengths that are available. 1 TU, 2 TU, 5 TU, 10 TU. You don't know what to use. So till now, diagnosis of TB was based on history, Mantu test, chest x-ray, ESR. That's how we used to diagnose TB. And we still do that in spite of talking about gene expert, cultures, everything we talk about. But we still base our treatment diagnosis based on this. Often we used to start treatment because it's a non-resolving pneumonia. We are in an endemic country for TB. So we, this is probably TB. Or patient had symptoms with a positive Mantu. Or there was a contact with a patient having TB. Or sometimes just this child is having a high ESR, malnourished, not doing well, let's start AKT. So there have been these indications. A Lot of us have done that. We've started treatment based on these criteria. And why did we do that? Because it's difficult to get uh, cultures or gene expert done in children. It's possibacillary. And it's very difficult to get a yield in these patients. In adults, we don't do a Mantu test to make a diagnosis of TB. We base it on a positive sputum culture. We do an X-ray chest. In children, to get this kind of a sputum, either we need a GL, which means admission, putting in a Ryles tube, it's not very pleasant, a bal or an induced sputum. So nothing which is very convenient to do in children. So we said we'll do a Mantu test. And we keep on doing Mantu test. Now, how do we do a Mantu test? What is this Mantu? It's a tuberculin protein. And it's an extract of the tuberculous bacillus, first described by Robert Koch in 1890. And this technique was first described by Charles Mantu. He's a French scientist in 1912. So Mantu has been here for almost 100 years now. What is the principle of Mantu? It basically measures the hypersensitivity reaction to a previous exposure to mycobacterium. It may be mycobacterium tuberculosis. It could be environmental mycobacteria, that's your non-tuberculous mycobacteria, or it could be even BCG. BCG is also ultimately a mycobacterium. So it detects hypersensitivity reaction to previous exposure to mycobacterium, and it shares these antigens with all of them, with the NTMs, with the BCG, with the MTB. It does not measure immunity. Okay, immunity is by a different mechanism, whereas hypersensitivity is a delayed hypersensitivity. It's a different mechanism. And there's no correlation between the size of inuration and the likelihood of current active TB. So a lot of people think, oh, Mantu of 20. That means this child is having active TB. No, there's no correlation like that. There's no correlation at all of the size of Mantu and the status of current active TB. But if you do have a very strong Mantu, the likelihood of developing TB is high. Okay, so what we use actually Mantu is for latent TB. And we base our treatment of latent TB based on the size of the Mantu. So 10 millimeter, 15 millimeter tells us the likelihood of developing TB is very high. So we start treatment for latent TB. Problems with Mantu cannot differentiate between past or recent infection. Today, if the Mantu is positive, I don't know when the exposure occurred. Was it two years back, five years back, or was it six months back? I don't know the time. BCG can also give a false positive Mantu. And as I told you, non-tuberculous mycobacterium. We've had patients where I remember one child who was referred to me where he had an episode of hematemesis. <coughs> and that hematin uh, whatever that fluid was, was sent for AFP smear, and it came out positive. Hematemesis. X-ray chest normal. The pediatrician also did a CT chest, which was normal. But because that AFP smear was positive, and a mantu which was borderline around 9 millimeter to 10 millimeter, they wanted to know whether to start AKT or not. What I did is I called up the lab which had done the AFB smear and I asked them, how do you wash your ZN stains? So they said tap water. Tap water is where your AFB is, environmental. So not necessary every AFB smear positive means MTB. 
It could be environmental mycobacteria. It doesn't tell me disease. Disease is told me by culture, not by smear. Smear just tells me there is AFB present. Whether it's actively multiplying, that doesn't, it does not tell me. So it's very difficult to interpret MAN2 without a clinical correlation. What we assume is younger the patient, most likely the MAN2 is because of an infection. That's what is the dictum, that if you have a younger patient, less than five years, with a positive MAN2, chances are that he has a disease. But then what about BCG? I'll come to that. You can have false negative MAN2. So if you, do, you developed a disease and you did a MAN2 very early during the disease, like a primary progressive TB, you could get a MAN2 which is negative. A very old TB, MAN2 can become negative. Very young age, less than six months, MAN2 may be negative. Very disseminated TB, miliary TB, MAN2 may be negative, or you've not given MAN2 properly. Now, which TB unit to use? Earlier, we used to use the old PPD. Then in 1958, the PPD S was started, that is the protein uh, which was purified, and what was recommended is you're supposed to use 5 TU of PPD S. Then this PPD S was combined with twin AT to have a detergent action so that the tuberculin does not stick to the plastic or the glass syringe. And then finally, this was converted into a research tuberculosis, that is your PPD RT. So PPD RT, one TU is equivalent to five TU of PPDS. So the current recommendation is we are supposed to use one TU of PPDRT, or we could use five TU of PPDS. Both are equivalent. But when you're using RT, you stick to one TU. You're supposed to give it intradermal uh, with a tuberculin syringe, 0.1 ml. You're supposed to do a reading after 40 to 48 to 72 hours. Now, mind you, MAN2 is a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. A negative reading at 48 hours does not mean it's negative. You could keep on reading the mantu till one week. If the mantu becomes positive even after 48 hours, it still means positive mantu. So there have been instances where patients had negative mantu at 48 hours, but subsequently did develop a positive mantu. And what you look for is induration and not the erythema. Now what do you consider as positive mantu? As per WHO, malnourished children, patients who are immunocompromised, anything more than five. Patients who have received BCG or not received BCG, but with a normal immunity, more than 10. Very clear, simple. But in an endemic area, I came across this paper which said 10 can be borderline. And what it says, this is a paper by Chadda et al, which says that if you have an induration of more than 15, more likely there is an infection. But if you have an induration between 10 and 14, it could be infection with atypical mycobacteria, it could be BCG, or it could be just a TB with a contact. So they said that if you have an uh, mantu between 10 and 14, you need to correlate it clinically to actually make a diagnosis whether there is TB or not. So again, there is a problem. Guidelines mention 10 as the cutoff. Papers are mentioning probably not 15. So I went through literature to tell me whether BCG, is it really affecting the mantu results? Is it giving us a false mantu? So there's this paper in 2006, International Journal of Tuberculosis and Lung Disease. They studied over two and a half lakh patients who, were, who had received BCG as infants. And what they found is that BCG can give you an effect on a TST up to 10 years. So you could have a BCG that is causing a positive mantu up to 10 years. And this is a large group of patients. There was another study which was published in 2008 and they wanted to see what happens to TST over a period of time when you've received BCG at birth. And they found that the optimal cutoff values if you discard BCG induced positive TST is much different. So they say in infants you should take at least 21 millimeters, two to three years take 18 millimeters, four to five years take 13 millimeters, above six years start taking 10. So they said the BCG effect would be up to six years. The meta-analysis earlier that I showed you said 10 years. Then there have been various other papers. Now this was a paper which was published which said that if you take 10 millimeter cutoff and you take various kinds of TB, pulmonary, extra pulmonary, lymphadenopathy, your sensitivity and specificity is almost around 75% with MAN2. But if you take a cutoff of 15, it goes up. Your sensitivity and specificity becomes much better, almost 85%. 
So they said that if you have a mantu which is more than 15 millimeter, you have a highly sensitive, uh, highly specific mantu, though the sensitivity may be less. So what did we do? We tried to study all patients who had received mantu and were BCG vaccinated who were referred to our clinic. And there were 371 children, of which finally 341 were treated with AKT and 30 were not treated with AKT. They did not have TB. And out of those, Mantu was positive in 61%. So a lot of our diagnosis was not actually based on Mantu test. Over a period of years, we find that the TST positive in patients who had TB wanes off. So you tend to pick up more Mantu positive and TB at younger age as compared to older children. And when we took Mantu cutoff as 10 millimeter, what we found is the sensitivity of TST was 62%, but specificity was 56%. But when we took uh, differentiation as 15 millimeter, the sensitivity went down, much, much down, but the specificity went up. So that means we were picking up a lot of false positive mantus when we were giving 10 millimeter as a cutoff. And when we were using 15 millimeter, though the yield was less, we were picking up specific TB in these patients. But this is preliminary data. How do we prove it? So what we found is sensitivity and specificity of TST is poor. Since, uh, specificity increases if we take a cutoff of 15. And pulmonary TB had more TST positive as compared to extra pulmonary. Then there have been instances of what happens if we repeat a mantu. Today somebody did a mantu which was negative. You repeat it after one week, what happens to that mantu? That will boost it by probably one or two millimeters, not more. When do you say conversion? Conversion means the mantu changed by 10 millimeters. So if it was five and became 15, then you know it's a conversion. Then it tells you there was an active tuberculous exposure. So then we had these igras that came out because mantu was really becoming a headache with uh, just clinical diagnosis based on mantu. So we had these specific mycobacterial antigens that were isolated. So you had these igras, these are in vitro hypersensitivity tests. You do it on a blood sample. And they, allow, they are more specific because they don't get affected by BCG, nor are they affected by the environmental mycobacteria. So you had these igras, that is your T-spot and the quantiferon goal. And they basically are the same principle, delayed hypersensitivity reaction, except that the protein that is used in Mantu is the purified protein derivative, PPD, whereas here it's the ESAT-6 and the CFP-10. And these are the kits that are available. Again, these can be done by you. I mean, you don't need a lab for doing this. And then you have uh, quantiferon goal, which gives you a quantitative result, positive, negative, in the uh, uh, range of numbers. Whereas you have T-spot, which is a little uh, you know, observer dependent, because you have to count the number of dots. So that becomes a problem. So this test is really not picked up in India. What is picked up is a quantiferon goal. Now, advantage of IGRA, you could do it with a single visit. Patient just goes to the lab, gives a blood sample. It's not affected by BCG. One IGRA positive does not mean every time the IGRA is going to be positive, unlike Mantu, where Mantu could remain positive for years. Disadvantage, again, like Mantu, it doesn't tell us activity. It, can, it cannot differentiate between latent or active TB. It's not yet standardized in children less than four years. And its effect in immunocompromised children or patients who have received AKT is still not established. So again, we tried to compare. From our BCG study, we found that probably if we took a reading of 15, the specificity was much better. So we tried to compare Mantu and Igra and see what happened. So we took 33 patients. Out of these 33 patients, 24 had a positive Mantu. And Igra was positive only in 15. These were all patients suspected of TB. These are not diagnosed TB. Yeah. And the specificity of TST, when taken as 10, was 29%. And when we took it as 15, the TST specificity increased to 63%. What is important is the correlation. When we did with TST and IGRA, so the agreement, if we're taking a TST of 15, the agreement that we are finding, look at this, where you have a QFT which is negative, that is IGRA negative, but 11 patients had a TST positive. Another Mantu three minutes, yeah. Dr. Ira. So Mantu positive and IGRA negative. So the correlation is absolutely really bad. So I just want you to look at the first slide, the overall correlation. So that means what were we picking up? Either the IGRA was 
really bad, not picking up cases, or the manto was wrong and picking up a lot of false positive. So what did we conclude? The specificity of TST as compared to IGRA is low. Increasing the TST measurement to 15 doubles the specificity rate of MAN2. And how does the IGRA help you? IGRA does not help you to make a diagnosis of TB. It only helps you to rule out false positive MAN2. So when you are doing IGRA, you are not making a diagnosis of TB. You are only ruling out false positive MAN2. So whenever you do IGRA, do a MAN2 test. And then the problems of 10 TU and 5 TU and always there. So don't make ever a diagnosis of TB on the basis of 10 TU. Okay, either one to you, that is the RT one, or the five to you, which is the PPDS. So I am going to conclude before three minutes are over, and I hope <laughs> all of you all have started thinking and not stopped thinking. So let us go further, and I hope I've confused you enough and created more controversy than ever before. Thank you very much. <laughs>